So what do ranchers and the land stewards need to keep ranching? So our next presenter is Robert Irwin with the Chaos Sheep Outfit. It is a target grazing company serving Mendocino, Lake and Calusa counties in Northern California. So Robert, you're up. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're traveling, we were at the American Sheep Industry Association meetings over the weekend. So we're trying to make it home, but we, I don't go anywhere without buying sheep. So we had to stop and get some sheep bought, but uh, a little bit about us. So we graze uh, vineyards, rangelands, pears, uh, cover crops. So we work with organic and conventional farmers kind of across spectrums. And then we work with uh, BLM and uh, some other public agencies uh, about weed, so noxious weed removal and then fire removal. We're kind of scattered a little bit more. We've grown in. Um, the drought has pushed us into a larger uh, geographical map. So uh, we've, I think we've added about three or four counties to kind of make up for the lack of uh, feed and water for the sheep which is an extreme challenge uh, for us is, is to find a year round supply of feed. But uh, some of these other things that uh, we were kind of talking about is our year starts in the vineyard and then we go to our open spaces for fire fuel reduction. And then uh, June, July, when the start this was really coming on and that's when we attacked our uh, auction. That mo mostly what we get, we get used for is the noxious weed is star thistle and we manage that through the middle of summer and then uh, personally for us, our kind of big hole is, is, is August, September, end of July, most all of August and half of September. And then, then everything takes back off again with cover crops and uh, in the farming stuff. But uh, one of the biggest things is an industry in California that we're really fighting with right now is our labor issues. Uh, the H2A uh, with the overtime rules that are being applied starting the first of the year have really up the amount of money we're having to pay to our workforce. Um, and that's been a, uh, an incredible challenge trying to figure out how to uh, go around, navigate through that. Is your, uh, we're really getting a 50 to a 60% increase like instantaneously per line items. It'll be a 100% increase uh, by 2025, I believe. Don't hold me to that. Um, and so we've been really struggling as, as an industry uh, to, to figure out how to navigate through that. Uh, one of the other things that, that I feel we have a, a tough time with is the construction of our industry. So the access to trucks, freight, moving things around. Uh, we just lost another uh, really intricate guy that moved a lot of sheep around in Northern Cal, well, all of California, but in, uh, he's based out of Dixon. Uh, uh, Carb shut his trucks down and he's old enough and, and kind of in that form where he doesn't want to go any further. So he's not going to reinvest in new equipment. So that's been, uh, it's going to be a challenge because uh, as other as there's less and less animals in this state, uh, the people that are, that are the businesses that support it are going to be less and less interested in supporting it. So that's uh, another uh, challenge that we're going to have to overcome and then in, 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 the, in the short term and long term. Um, one of the things that could really help us, because I try not to be negative too much, I like to stay positive, uh, is that in our systems, what, we, what we're building with is, uh, you know, if we could get help in that tech sector to make a, a, an app of some sort to track the sheep movement, animal, read, you know, the, our cell phones would read animal ID tags and move things along so that anybody out in the field, not just the ranch manager, we can be keeping track. And then that would be forwarded to the ranch manager, or the foreman or the lead in um, kind of this tech stuff. Cause we do a lot of stuff with uh, mapping for carbon and uh, we map everywhere our sheep have been from January 1st to December 31st. We map the field we put them in and keep all that kind of data points. And I think there's going to be a lot more of that, especially in the targeted grazing community, which I think is going to really grow. That's going to be the sector that really grows in the state of California. And uh, then, and part of that too, I, I believe it, that would be a really useful tool in that part is the education of the new people that are going to be coming into targeted grazing. They're in, in growing in that regard. 
and I think a uh, better communication uh, between farmers and the like the rangeland, the government agencies, the ranchers uh, to fill in for um, you know the permits and stuff that were in the mountain, you know, the mount uh, the sheep permits and cattle permits, so that they're, the availability when they're open that the people are talking to these younger producers that are really looking for a, an opportunity uh, to get out on on some of these forest and and BLM permits up in the mountains. Uh, I know we've been struggling trying to find uh, something like that, and, and it seems like it's all a closed backdoor deal when that all happens, and so. This huge influx of new uh, producers that's, that that is happening. Uh, we need to, you know, as an industry wide, you know, we need to make that conduit to those new young up and coming people, and to the the infrastructure of, of where things are if they're going to, you know, have the opportunity to. But education in in making all of that happen. Uh, as an industry, we got a pile of challenges. You know, that they pulled the uh, trappers in our communities in Lake and Mendocino County. So we don't have predator control up there. And so uh, that's bringing another set of challenges in. So it's putting more pressure on our guard dogs and our fencing. And uh, nothing we can't overcome, but those are some of those issues. You know, when you're working with us as a company, we need access to water. That's been a pretty uh, hard thing to come by for the last two years. And, and e e you know, easy availability to it to do what we're doing out on the land. Let's say a homeowners association, uh, you know, to put in a fire break around uh, around housing development. So those are all like little things when you're working with us to help make life easier. Working with any grazer, uh, where's the water? Here's the water. Um, access with trucks. Uh, one of the the, the biggest uh, one of the first things I look for when I go onto a site to kind of see if we we're even able to do it is whether we can get it, how, how hard is it going to be to get uh, semi trucks in and out uh, to really make a, you know, we've got, we run about 3000 of our own use and then we manage another uh, three to 10,000 more sheep on top of that. And, uh, and I believe to make a real impact, what we found in our, you know, what we do is to make an impact, uh, positive impact you got to have a lot of animals and you know you uh you go through life and you sort through things but the you know 10 sheep i i get frustrated with vineyards that have 10 sheep and say that they graze 100 acres with the 10 sheep because that doesn't put any carbon in the soil and so uh instead of being a marketing ploy to make it a, vi a viable you know land service crop service to it to make a real difference you've got to have the number of animals and then once you get into that then you're not talking uh, about getting a small truck in there you've got to get large ones so and then getting the communities and one of the things that i'm really passionate about is is getting everybody in the community to work together so um, when you get a 10 acre or 15 acre vineyard let's say or a homer association over in this corner is to uh get a uh, another vineyard or their neighbors and so work as a community not as a so it's actually worked really well in mendocino county uh, it's starting to work in napa county where um more than one uh you, you start it you start let's say with a 400 acre vineyard and then by the time you get done four years down the road you're doing five to six hundred acres around that uh, and then building the community kind of so they're all working together and then that drives our costs down that takes our trucking bill and our carbon footprint down and it helps the entire community and then the smaller vineyards by working together with other people that can then afford us because I can't afford to come in with semis to do a 10 acre vineyard without uh, really raising up my rates or open spaces whatever you're thinking and so we can adjust our prices by being a community again and I uh we really advocate against that, or not again, advocate for that, sorry. Uh, so those are some of the things I look at. Uh, the sheep, the availability to animals is going to get more and more challenging. Uh, the tighter and uh, the, the tighter, the less less producers we have in the commercial world, the availability. I, I utilize a lot of feeder lands. 
So uh, as the labor rates aren't going to directly affect me, I mean, they are, but I'm passing that cost on to my uh, customers. My, my, the people I buy feeder lambs from are out in a range and they're not getting paid to be anywhere. And so as their costs go through the roof, they're more likely to quit raising sheep. And then therefore I won't have uh, in the cattle world stalker animals, but feeder lambs to purchase, to put out on those, on those open spaces to do fire breaks. And, you know, we work really closely with fiber shed uh, doing a lot of research in carbon sequestration and what we're doing. And, uh, you know, the availability of those animals. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm struggling. That's why we're, I drove down to San Diego. It's like on my way back, I even a hundred animals at this point, we've been driving around picking up hundred at a time. Uh, and I think that's going to become a harder thing to do in the future is getting those animals when you need it, when you want them, where you need them to make it, to make a positive impact on, uh, on our range and, and, and in our environment all the way around. Does anybody have any qu questions or anything? Yeah, we have a have a one or two here. You you talked about the challenges in the dealing with the regulations, uh, the cost of, of management of, of sheep, the short sightedness of the boards of supervisors that took away the trappers. Sorry, editorial comment satisfied that in there. Uh, I'm from Mendocino County, and I granted I shake my head at that, but nonetheless, what other issues? The question that is posed is a cause for the decrease in the sheep numbers. Uh, my so my phone rang, so you got the what? What was the last part of that question? The, the the question was, what other factors are going into the decrease in the sheep numbers besides the ones that you've you've already talked about? So the number one I think is going to happen in the state of California is age. I think that the eight, I call it the, they call it the graying of the industry. I think it's, it's the same in the cattle industry. But so, like, I think this year alone, I think the state of California, there's probably going to be five to six, uh, five to six older men or operators retire. Um, there's nobody to take it over. Uh, the prices are high, and this is the time to step out. So, I think that good prices on livestock and the age of the producer is going to be a, a one of the other main reasons, uh, Mendocino County was really heavy into predator loss, and that's, you know, back in the 90s, and that's why the sheep left then. I think now it's it's the labor, age, and the lack of youth uh, and enthusiasm. I, I really, uh, I really do believe that the lack of enthusiasm. I mean, my, even my grandfather's uncle were until they couldn't force me to do anything else, were trying to get me to do anything but raise sheep. Um, and so I think the, that we've got to make, it's got to become enthusiastic again. But I think part of that too is, is, is influx of technology and, and ideas and new ways of doing things and, uh, and not to stagnant. My grandfather did it that way and I'm going to continue to do it that way. So, uh, but the age, I, I, and I think the lack of, ed, and uh, how's the right way to say it? The lack of, excitement and energy into a young generation to get into to get into the industry thank you uh, are there other questions we have a few comments i'll read to to robert since he's on, he's on his cell phone and probably can't see the chats but if there's any other questions uh, let us know uh, a couple of the comments uh, so impressed you can be here while driving with your family and the trailer load of sheep yeah, and it's a fascinating set of interrelated problems to address. Thanks for your presentation. And then uh, your comments remind this person about the animals on the on the shelf. How do you manage sheep throughout the year? So I guess there's one question there for you. So that is uh, the biggest trick. So a lot of the vineyards that we work for and, and, and land managers, they, they want to own their own sheep and they've all tried it. And then it gets into a tough time of the year and they don't want to own them anymore. What we've decided to do as a company and we, we as a family, I guess, has become a little bit of a gypsies. Uh, so we don't haul the uh, feed to sheep. We haul the sheep to feed. Uh, so that and then what why we've kind of picked our spot in the world is if you go to 
uh, Mendocino County, you're looking at a 48 uh, inch you know, average rainfall. And then uh, down in Palooza County, you're looking at you know, 10 to 14, 16 inches. And so we're able to flux on dry years, we go further west and on really wet years, we kind of manage to stay in the middle because it sheds water better on top of Lake County. So uh, what we look for is other opportunities. So uh, like the Star Thistle program, uh, we started with the BLM uh, in Cache Creek. Uh, I mean, we almost, I mean, we've made such an, as of the prior to the sheep being there, they were getting over three to 400 uh, negative emails about their, about their watershed, their, their camps and, and everything. And then we started working with them and within three years, now they're getting between 50 and hundred positive emails. Uh, and that's kind of what we've got to get working on is those other relationships that you haven't seen or know, and maybe, you know, uh, I know it's not a California issue, but like in the, in the, in the mountain, uh, mountain North or, uh, they've got leafy spurge, North Dakota and Montana and they're, uh, they're using sheep where the cattle won't eat it. They're putting sheep in. So that goes into a mixture of livestock uh, where you, you know, I've got partners that run cattle and I run sheep and I sneak in behind the cattle and clean up the weeds that the, the, that the cattle won't eat. That'll make it harder for the cattle to do a good job on that range in the future. So I, I, to me, it's relationships. Life is a pile. You just got to tie a pile of relationships together. And when somebody has something that that they don't want, maybe you know, maybe you can make that into something that'll work or be positive, and vice versa. You know, something that's been really hindering, let's say, a cattle rancher, might be really helping a sheep farmer or sheep rancher, and and then kind of mixing those things. And there's you mix goats in with that as well, and you you've really got a pretty good recipe. Great, Robert. Thank you for your presentation. I know you're getting you're on your cell, but we're gonna put your contact information in the chat. So if anybody has any questions, wants to get a hold of you, they can. We really Perfect. appreciate you taking time from your trip and hope you have a safe journey back home. Yeah, you guys, it's, it's great to kind of catch up and hear some of the, the re, you know, it's good. Uh, I don't stop enough long enough to, to see what everybody else is doing and see the research and it's fun. It's exciting. And thank you guys for doing all that you do. Thank you. And our second, we have a little change to the agenda. Our second panelist is actually John Ostel with the 4J Horse and Livestock Company in San Diego. We heard a little bit about that earlier this morning. So we want to bring, bring John on as Doug was unable to make it today. So John, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? You guys hear me okay? Yeah, you sound yes. good, John. Yes. yes. Very good, very good. Okay. Well, uh, Sheila asked me to kind of uh, in uh, jump in here at the last minute while I'm out driving around on the ranch to explain a little bit about what we've got going down here uh, on uh, the reserve. Tracy and Lance really kind of uh, just gave you a great summary of, of what we've got going on down here in San Diego. Um, for our particular operation, the... Um, we started off with NRCS as being our major banker or backer rather uh, to get the, the infrastructure going here on the, on the reserve. Um, and then followed by RCD uh, or not RCD, but the, the CDFA uh, healthy soils grant uh, that is also a part of, the, of our relationship here with, uh, with uh, Rancho Hamul Ecological Reserve. So what we've got is we've got a grazing and rest uh, program going where we uh, can rotate to different uh, paddocks and we move, uh, we graze the different paddocks for different reasons, whether it's the burrowing owl or raptors or, or uh, uh, something else, basically, uh, that's how we've got set up. Um, so um, NRCS does uh, the internal infrastructure was solar wells, and we did wildlife fencing on the reserve, and uh, they do not do perimeter fencing, uh, but we did wildlife fencing through the preserve uh, that allowed our, our uh, deer to flow through the property and wildlife to flow through the property without any hesitation whatsoever. 
Um, they do this type of fencing up in Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. They've been doing it for years. Um, uh, they don't have their their open range, but down here, we, most of the California is closed range, so you don't want to have that type of fencing right along the road. But uh, it's worked very well for uh, the reserve as far as allowing wildlife to flow through while containing our livestock to uh, you know, enhance habitats and uh, uh, store carbon and, and uh, help with the burrowing owl program as well. I think more than anything uh, in San Diego County is we're, we are trying to encourage more like Lance and, and Tracy were talking about. We need to have people feel comfortable uh, with what we're doing. Uh, the only way I can figure out to do that is basically through education. There's a tremendous amount of new science that's coming out. We've heard it today here. Uh, it's just, it's tough to come up with. It's all good stuff. It's all good science. It's positive. It's, it's basically, basically saying you can't, there's no more reason to leave these properties fallow or leave them alone. We have to do something. So what's happening is we've got a lot of momentum down here in San Diego County. It's taken a while, but they're starting to feel more comfortable. Land managers uh, that are on conserved lands uh, that just aren't familiar with it. So basically, we've been educating for through the Healthy Soils Grant. Through uh, we had a couple of uh, rancher to rancher uh, programs down here that basically introduced what we were doing uh, on on the reserve. And it's, it start to open minds to to that type of uh, that type of active management of these of the lands. One of the biggest things that I'm concerned with, along with other people, I've heard it mentioned several times, or even Robert mentioned it, is the fact that really we have we don't have a younger generation uh, coming up being excited about what we're doing. Uh, it's uh, it's important to really um, cultivate that. I've got three boys uh, that uh, basically our project down here the, is a, a, a cow calf uh, um, operation. We carry year, then we carry yearlings, then we do a, a, a small farm to uh, table uh, direct to consumer uh, uh, operation. And through this operation, we're educating people here locally on what's the advantages of grazing along with providing a good healthy product. But one of the things is, is that we ended up having a situation where my boys were in 4-H and decided to start this. And uh, I have a, a degree in animal science from uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. So I had the ability to go ahead and, and understand some of this, but there's a lot of new science over the last seven to eight years regarding just range management uh, that is uh, just exciting to see come to the table. And I think the better education we do of our local ranchers, uh, local policy makers, uh, people that are in decision making uh, capacities, uh, including the political people, the more education that we do to these, these entities or these people or these structures basically is gonna be beneficial to, to us as a whole. Uh, and we are doing, you know, everything, the climate smart ag, the, you know, storing of carbon, uh, all these things are so positive that it, it does, it does really indicate a need for help in some fashion for infrastructure on properties that don't have it. And so we're seeing a little bit more, I'm seeing a little bit more of that coming into play uh where there are some funding for either wildlife fencing or internal structure or solar wells uh which allows livestock or cattle to get in areas that they weren't there before um because of just no water or they're keeping cattle out of creeks and riparian areas during certain times of the year so they're not in there uh at the wrong time of the year uh, so there's lots of new management styles that are coming out. I don't know what the answer is. I do know it's just important to really cultivate our newer generation or a younger generation or even older ranchers that are open minded to this, uh, to some of this new stuff that's coming out uh, just for us to be able to raise food. 
We need to, we need people to raise our food, and it's just uh, it's that important. So I don't know what else. Basically, I could enlighten enlighten everybody on uh, from what I'm doing down here, from what everybody else is already doing. I do know that uh, our wildfire uh, mitigation is 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 paramount down here. Tracy showed you a a picture of the gate fire that came down and was going to burn up a lot of our feed and uh, we caught a break and it, the wind shifted and uh, the flames dropped from 20 feet down to about six inches and then they ran up and down the road with their fire hoses and put it out and uh, Tracy and I looked at each other after that and said we got to come up with a plan. So I went across the street to Cal Fire and we started to come up with a plan on how to graze uh, for wildfire mitigation to reduce you know, wildfire fuel um, around the reserve. Uh, we do have a spot where there are million dollar homes right across from, from one of the areas that we do graze in. And uh, all I know is the community is elated that we are here and that we are being proactive in that measure. So that, uh, that is what I think you're gonna find out in the community as we continue to educate and let people know uh, what's going on uh, with our grazing, uh, no matter what livestock we're using. Um, I think that's important for us to just keep educating, not, you know, the community and, uh, and our policy holders and policy makers um, in their agendas. I'm not sure if that's making sense, but anyway, that's all I have. I'm out here on the ranch, just uh, kind of running around hauling water today, but uh, it's, it's uh, it's a beautiful day down here in San Diego, and we still need more moisture. John, thank you, and I think a lot of folks are envious of what you're you're doing today, and versus some of us who are sitting in inside and not enjoying that out there. Uh, you folks are doing a lot down there, and, and as we heard earlier, it's folks don't realize just what is the vibrant grazing and areas farming areas in San Diego County. 